Really good to be with you tonight. I'm Stephen Randles, as you may or may not know by now. Uh, I teach Old Testament, among other things, and uh, love to do that. And I'm so glad to be here. Um, we've got an interesting part of tonight that we've, you know, in my graphics curve that I show you, we're going to take a little upturn for a while and uh, see the, after the decline of the northern kingdom that ended in 722 BC and then, then the, the decline of the southern kingdom that ended with the Babylonian exile in 586 BC. And so we've preached those the last two weeks and, and wept over them and cried over them and saw God's sovereignty in the middle of them. And yet we begin to see how relevant so much of it was even to our current environment. The thing I ended up last week with talking about Habakkuk's prophecy concerning the debt of a nation. And we went through really a very destructive process that happens to a nation in debt. And uh, in Habakkuk 2, it describes that very vividly. And so we spent some time looking at that. And tonight we're going to start right there and begin with the exile and uh, go on to further a part of what happened after the exile. So let's pray together and ask the Lord to put his hand on what we're talking about and let us receive of, of the promise. Lord, we don't take these kind of lessons lightly. We know that they're from your word. And Lord, we're, we want to give the message of covenant and the message of your people, the message to your people, through you, Lord. And Lord, we just ask you to, to be with us as we unfold these scriptures and unfold the, the powerful, powerful word of God that you tried to give your people and only some of them received them. And Father, we just ask that you would open our hearts and open our spirit and open our ears that we might hear what the spirit of the Lord is speaking. And Father, we just ask you to touch us and be with us this night as we share this, uh, this, this time of restoration of the children of Israel. And uh, we ask you to bless and help and strengthen in Jesus' name. Let me just remind you that I'm going to be gone next week. Uh, you'll have another teacher. I'm not, I don't know for sure who that's going to be, so I won't announce that. But you will have another teacher here next Wednesday. I'll be gone, as you know, or maybe you have heard me say I'm leaving on Saturday morning. Uh, with, And turns out Mike Mahoney from our church is going to go with me, which is very nice. I'm really glad he's going with me. Uh, and we're going to fly to Mexico and teach for a week in our school down there, Institute of Biblico Internacional. And that's poor Spanish translation of Biblical Institute International. And um, I don't speak English. I'm careful not even to, to try to speak it because the minute you say Spanish, sorry. Yeah, we do speak English somewhat. Maybe I'll take my cough drop out. We'll do a little better here. Yeah, so, well, uh, I don't speak Spanish, and I'm careful not even to try because the minute you try, they think you know it. And so they jabber on in Spanish, and you have no idea what they're saying, and yet they think you've got it all at the end. And so you have to say, see, sí, see, sí, mm, no comprende, no comprende. You know, no entiendo, you know, uh oh, I said a few words there that makes me think you might know something. So we have to be careful. But we'll be doing that. I'll be down there for a week. We'll be teaching 18 lessons like this, similar to what we're doing here, but the subject will be Christ's kingdom in the marketplace, which is my background after 50 years of business. A lot of this developed out of the call of God on my life that said my message would come through the world of business and come through management and leadership. I've been, had the privilege of being parts of many, several large companies, uh, leading edge companies with IBM and with the Manned Space Center and IBM with the banking and ATMs and IBM with the retail, you know, point of sale terminals, all of those were things that mm, I had people who were working and installing those in the early days when before we thought about some of those things. But 
But we had a great industry, and in the last 25 years spent most of that in the healthcare, which is the most complex industry there is to try to manage the information of. And, uh, you know, I have some metrics that I measure to as to how complex it is uh, that banks do four things and manufacturing turn companies do six things, hospitals do 35 things. That's the level of complexity that you're talking about. So uh, when you look at that, I love the, the, I love the hospital environment and the information to find part of the hospitals and worked with those for many years. And uh, so, so it's been a wonderful career that I've had along with my teaching of the scripture that I loved and started teaching in our Sunday school class and as a young married, less than a year when I first started teaching, mar young married class, and I don't know how I got to be the teacher, but I did, and uh, I was chosen by the doctor of philosophy that he was teaching and says, you, sh you should teach this class, and I said, oh, well, whatever, but I'm young, I don't know what, and he said, yes, you do, so I've been teaching ever since, and uh, so started at 21, so now I'm a little bit older than that, so I've been teaching a long time. So, so we've, been, we've had a good time. The last 50 years, I've been teaching really lots of the Old Testament because the Lord put me into it when I was 25, really in an intensive way. And uh, so I've loved to look at the Old Testament in lots of detail and see how it relates to the New Testament and the pointing to the new covenant in Christ. So tonight, we're going to pick up and you know that I like to show you where we are. So I did change the title. You might see that put the red in there just so we know where we were, that we're going to talk about tonight the, the exile and reformation part of chapter 9. So we have nine north king, northern kingdom and nine southern kingdom, and now we're on nine exile and restoration. You say, why didn't you divide them? And I said, well, because they all go together. So let's look now just a minute what we've talked about. So this is the picture that we've been talking about, that the, the kingdom after Solomon, which was the glorious time with the temple, the building of the temple, we now split the tribes, tribes apart, and the southern kingdom had two tribes that went under Rehoboam, and that's what we literally have put to together to, to make this come together. So intermarriage with southern tribes, with the, the surrounding tribes, Rehoboam, his son, was made king. And we see that they went downhill to the time of lost territory to the enemies. And meanwhile, all these prophets, Joel and Amos and Jonah, went to the land countries around Israel to speak to them. Isaiah and Ezekiel and Hosea and Micah were all in the middle of the kings talking about to Hezekiah and some of the middle kings. We talked about that. Nahum and Zephaniah also were, were part of that group. It was speaking to the kings. And then we finally get to Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Micah that were at the end of the time and were in the last kings of the southern kingdom. And they were crying out and weeping. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet because he was weeping. He was weeping over the nation, weeping over as it was being destroyed by sinfulness. And here you have, and then the economic decline we talked about last week. We talked about Habakkuk and talked about the cycle of economics as it related to the debt of the nation. And then we also introduced the fact that the Babylonians began to conquer the land and not the Assyrians. Syrians is Syrians and taken over the the ten kingdoms in the north, uh, the only, uh, they, they were conquered by the Babylonians, and now the Babylonians begin to take over Israel. And there's stories we shared about that, the judgment and the destruction by Babylon. And finally, in 586 B.C., the temple and Jerusalem were destroyed, and the final people were carried off and uh, mixed in with to the Babylonian Empire. We call that the exile instead of the dispersion. Remember the word that I made the difference? What's dispersion? What does dispersion mean? Spread out, right? The northern ten tribes were dispersed, dispersed throughout the kingdoms, lost forever. 
We don't know where the ten king, ten tribes are. But we do know the two tribes, Benjamin and Judah, and some Levites, all went to Babylon and were part of the Babylonian exile with the promise that they would come back eventually. So the remnant of the covenant of God was passed down through the tribe of Judah, which king was David was of the tribe of Judah, and all his, all his successors were the tribe, the kings that went after him. So here we are. The remnant was sent to Babylon, and talking about the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, systematically took down Solomon's temple, carried off all the gold and silver that was in it, the fixtures, and we'll see that come back around we know that they made it to babylon and they were kept intact and we'll understand why a little bit in nate later in this lesson but they were basically carried off by the kings of babylon and put in their temples as a offering that says look at this we overcame this powerful god of israel and god of judah that wasn't able to resist our gods and basically took glory in that however the southern kingdom was exiled rather than dispersed because we're going to see a return of them. So let's begin to do this. And I think the best way to do this is, again, to just use my line here and talk about the great turning away from God and talk about the prophetic warnings in general. But I want you to turn with me to the book of Daniel tonight. And we're going to spend a little bit of time about Daniel. And you say, wait, wait a minute, Daniel's not in the Kings and he's not in the Chronicles. And you're right, he isn't. But he is probably the best picture of history in that part of the, that, that period of time of any book in the Bible. So let's look at Daniel now. And let me just say very quickly, I am not going to do a total uh, end time prophecy out of the book of Daniel tonight. You'll have to come back to that in another time. We'll spend lots of times in looking at future times, but not tonight. There's lots of Daniel that we're not, not going to talk about. We're going to talk about what relates to the kings and the kingdoms and the period of exile. So what we know about this story is that Judah was ruled by a man named Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of the Babylonians. And... Our first introduced introduction to Nebuchadnezzar was in the first chapter of Daniel when he's talking about Daniel and his friends were taken into the household and the king's palace in Babylon. They were recognized for their, their sharp memories and their skills and their capabilities, their ability to learn, their ability to understand, and let me just say, they probably were neutered, uh, were not ever to, to have progeny, but they were basically part of the king's wise men that rep represented the king. And the Lord gave Daniel wisdom early on to be able to meet the needs of the people in this thing. So we're going to talk about Daniel's first encounter with Nebuchadnezzar had to do with his diet and his food. And so in the, in the lasciviousness and the, and the luxury of Babylon, the food was very rich and very, very strong and spices and all the things that make things taste good, um, and, but not very good for you. And so Daniel and his three friends, which were named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and I love to tell the story of my youngest daughter who seemed to have a great grasp of the Bible very early, and so our pastor in our church preached about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego one Sunday morning, and my, I think she must have been five, probably five years old, went up and said to the pastor, Pastor, you did know that that really is not their names, that their names were really Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And he, he said, well, you're right, that's true. 
their names were given to them by the Babylonian king, but she wanted him to understand that they were Hebrew names and not just these Babylonians' names. So I've always loved that story because, you know, she was already tuned into the details that her dad loved to talk about, and about the Old Testament and about what's happening. But these three Hebrew boys, uh, and Hananiah, Meshel, and Azariah became Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that you read about and you know their names by their Babylonians' names rather than their Hebrew names. Well, we don't know that. You know, I, that's a great question. I don't know. In some way, that was simple enough or something that, you know, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar didn't want to change that. And, huh? Yeah, he did. He was named Belshazzar or Belteshazzar, and uh, but he stayed with Daniel with his Hebrew name, at least in his writings. And so, so we, we're looking at this kind of input that come, and so as a result of their high performance in eating, they were chosen beyond others to lead the very real encounters with the government and with the politics and with the spreading of this very complex nation that basically had conquered the world around them and basically taken control of it. And now they had all these peoples and tribes that they needed to deal with. And Daniel became a person who was looked at as one who could really do the job. Well, Nebuchadnezzar liked that and made the choice and put them in charge but we know the story that after the second chapter of Daniel, he had a dream. And Daniel interpreted the dream, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But it was a very powerful dream that was actually foretelling almost world history. And basically looking at the kinds of formation that he saw in his dream, and Daniel was able to show him the Showing that, again, like Joseph, he basically gave God the credit for knowing all that. He didn't take the credit to himself. And he basically said, these are the times and the seasons that the God will do things. And you, O King Nebuchadnezzar, are the golden head of this idol. And then we know that the idol was divided into, into four parts. We're talking about the shoulders of bronze and the and the, the body of clay, and then finally the feet that were actually a mixture of clay and, 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 and iron together. And so you're talking about these kind of pictures of the future that your kingdom is the gold kingdom and all the others that follow that are going to be less powerful and less clear in Nebuchadnezzar like that. And he said, I really believe that needs to be shown to all the people. And I believe some people ought to worship that because I'm such a fine guy that's the golden head of this that I ought to be worshipped too. And it so happened that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not raised to worship other idols other than the God of gods. And so they very quickly ran into a cultural conflict. And I, I have another series that I teach in a different place where I, that's the whole subject is cultural conflict with a Christianity in a cultural conflict. And uh, this was a very real example of a cultural conflict that led to them being thrown angrily into the fiery furnace to be destroyed because they wouldn't yield to this King Nebuchadnezzar. And we know the story, the story that there were not three people in the fiery furnace, there was four. And Nebuchadnezzar recognized that fourth one, and he says, that appears to be the Son of God. How he knew that, I don't know, but some way his spirit met to that, and they pulled him out, and so his, his Nebuchadnezzar was first exposed to this Hebrew God in a powerful way through the fiery furnace and those Hebrew young men. This still begins to be part of Nebuchadnezzar's life. And we continue on with chapter 3 and see that, that 
he praised God at the end of that. He said, Nebuchadnezzar went near, and this is uh, 326, if you want to look at that. Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the fiery furnace and spoke, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. here. And then Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego came from the midst of the fire, and the satraps and administrators and all the officials uh, that were part of the king's court saw that, that they had, the bodies had not been touched by fire, the hairs of their head was not singed, or even their garments affected, and the smell of the fire wasn't even on them. However, the bindings around them had been, had been taken off. So Neb Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he who, who sent his angels and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies. They should not serve and worship gods except their own God. And he gave them the right to do that and opened it up. Well, it turns out that was a pretty good turnaround and recognition from chapter 3. But it went on into chapter 4. That wasn't the end of it. So Nebuchadnezzar now had a second dream, and he was really seeing that this was something that we needed to understand. And uh, he basically, Daniel came to warn him that says, the dream has to do with you, Nebuchadnezzar, old Neb. You know, you're basically going to be seen as a great and mighty person. And if you take that to yourself, rather than giving it to the God, the creator, God, you're going to run into some problems. So he basically described that, and he saw this beautiful dream of all the things that he'd built and uh, everything and heard the warning from Daniel, but did not live that warning out. And a year later, he did, in fact, give in to his wondrous acclaim to himself, and the Lord did send him away as a wild animal for seven years. It turns out I had a lovely picture driven, by, driven uh, drawn by one of the artists, and I was going to put it in here and decided we didn't need to see that tonight. But it was a, it's an artist rendition of what he must have looked like in his wild animal stages. And it was a pretty well done, and uh, we used it as part of my teaching when I taught 14-year-olds the Old Testament in high school. They liked that picture and, you know, and uh, responded to it very, very well. But I didn't put it in here for you tonight. I do have one. I'll show you here in a minute. That's a different one, but not that one. But this one, basically, Nebuchadnezzar came back at the end of chapter 4. And we read that in 434 now. You can turn to chapter 434. At the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me. I blessed the Most High and praised him and honored him who lives forever. And he realized again that this God of the Hebrews was more than anything he knew about. And for his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And basically in the eyes of God, he does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, no one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? Because he is the God of gods. And the same time his reasoning returned to him and he began to rule again in the land. Now I, the last verse, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works true and his ways justice and those who walk in his pride is able to He's not able to put anything down if given to God. So this was quite a story in chapters 1 through 4, but it gives you quite a picture of the Babylonian Empire and culture in the Babylonian Empire. You clearly had a king who was high wealth and high strength and controlled lots of things and took it over and controlled it, but yet yielded to God in the course of his reign because God met him these multiple times to get hold of him. So again, laying the groundwork for what's God's covenant picture. 
not unlike our picture back in Exodus when we talked, or in Genesis, when we talked about Joseph, we talked about how carefully prepared Egypt was for the embryonic development of the children of Israel in that environment. And here we are in, this, in the country of Babylon, the same kind of groundwork is being laid for the deliverance and for the, for the rest of the restoration of the people of God in the time of the Babylonian Empire too. So we see the next chapter of it starting in chapter 5 and this chapter comes a little different. So Babylon destroyed by the Medes and the Persians in chapter 5 and we're going to talk more about that. But the Medes and Persians came and they came based on a the son of Nebuchadnezzar which had taken over and begun to rule. We don't know how long, probably not very long, probably a couple of years was all that he ruled. And he had decided that he really enjoyed all those beautiful things that Nebuchadnezzar had brought back from the temple and the gold and the silver and the, and the beautiful things that, that he brought. And he decided that he would extol his God and, and basically show how mighty the God of the Babylonians was by having a formal banquet using this sacred uh, bowls and dishes and utensils that came out uh, for the worship of God in the temple in Jerusalem. So we know the story. So let's go on and look at this a little bit more. Let's just jump now to, I'm, I'm going to skip over from chapter 6. I'm going to skip then to chapter 9, and I'm going to talk about Daniel 9, and we're going to spend time with that one because that's the, the thing that began to release the children of Israel when Daniel began to pray a prayer of repentance. Let's look at Daniel now. I don't, I don't want to make sure we. I don't. I, I want to make sure we, we we hit this. I I remember the first time I really got into this book, and uh, there was a pastor that or a, a, a leader was was teaching about this, and he talked about the power of this chapter, and I've always there's. You know how there's chapters in your Bible that are meaningful that you've developed over the years and you know that verse and that scripture and this passage and things like that. And thankfully, as you get older, like I am, you remember more and more and more of those. And so this is one of them that I always turn to this one when I think about what's going on when we as a nation begin to repent. And so when I think about us as a, as a nation, I turned to Daniel 9, and I began to read about how Daniel interceded for his, his children of Israel that were in exile in Babylon. So it's a very interesting, and it ties into lots of things, and in some ways I'm skipping forward to some things to talk about this, but I want to talk about it in the context of Daniel. So look at this now. After the Medes and Persians came in and destroyed Belshazzar, we, well, you know, I have, this is all out of sequence now. I, 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 I have other things I want to say about Belshazzar, too. All right, let's come back to this one. Let's talk about Cyrus commissioned the rebuilding of, and that. So this is the overview of what we're going to see. We're going to see this decline in because Cyrus, and who we don't know who Cyrus is yet. I haven't told you that, but you may know. But he commissioned the rebuilding of the temple. So let's look at this. Here's the effect that we visualize. Nebuchadnezzar built a whole culture that was idolatry-centered, and basically the effect of his strong leadership built this kingdom, and they were able to conquer the lands around them, and we're going to see even a map of how, how big that kingdom was. Uh, the effect of the leadership was very real. Young and capable people were brought to be part of his kingdom and were used extensively throughout his kingdom to bring the culture of their insight and their knowledge into the ways of the Babylonians. They brought and put in special training. Daniel and his three friends were, were part of that. And Daniel walked in the integrity in God, Israel, seeking the Lord continually. He got himself in trouble, got himself you know, thrown in the lion's den. We know that story. But all of this was a result of his integrity and the God of God seeking the Lord continually. He was a scholar. 
clearly studied and understood the Old Testament because we see that here in the beginning of the ninth chapter is that he was looking at the words of God and beginning to understand something that needed to be prayed about very diligently. So let's look at that. I, I, I wish we could read our Bibles the same way. I wish we'd even, maybe even our newspapers the same way because those newspapers are saying big things these days that are going on in the world that would should and could prompt us to some intercessory prayer, not unlike we see Daniel unfold here in the ninth chapter. So let's turn to this ninth chapter. In the first year of Darius, the son of Azarias of the lineage of the Medes, so he was the king that was ruling over Babylon after Babylon had been, had been destroyed. So in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood, look at this, by the book, the numbers of the years specified of the word through Jeremiah the prophet. Well, what, who was Jeremiah the prophet? We remember he was one of the prophets that spoke to the end of the, of the kingdom of Judah just before it went into, and just after actually, just after it went into Babylon, Babylon, captivity in Babylon. So there's some chance that Jeremiah had actually gone to Babylon. Babylon. We don't know that for sure. But it's some chance that he spoke out of that to the people in Babylon, in exile, Continuing to prophesy that. Well, Daniel was at this same time, some time after him, probably a few years, probably less than 50 years after this. And he was be looking at the pro writings that Jeremiah had done, and he basically said he, that Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. So 70 years was going to be the time of the exile. And Daniel began to count as he was capable of doing, the astronomers and people that were part of that culture were very learned in terms of time, same periods. Some people believe that the wise man in the time of Jesus probably came as a result of the prophetic schools and the astrology, uh, the, the basically astrologers, uh, astronomers that put together the thoughts and the cycles of time to know about Jesus' coming. So, probably was the roots of it go back to this time that Daniel was there. And I began to understand that 70 years is what Jeremiah said was going to happen. So I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And this is not the first time he'd done it. I skipped over chapters 6, 7, and 8 where he'd done this several times where he'd gone into intensive prayer about things and basically, God had spoken to him through angels and other ways that he revealed. And the latter, from 10 through the end of the book, in chapter 12, we'll see that you will see, if you read it, that God spoke to him very specifically about end time and prophetic things. And he's, then I set my face toward the Lord to make request by prayer and supplication. I prayed to the Lord my God, and I made confession. Here we go. If we would pray that prayer that follows here, the Lord would change some things in our nation. O oh Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandment, we have sinned, O oh Lord, and committed iniquity, and we've done wickedly, and we rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. How, what's he talking about? He's talking about the period of the judges we talked about. He's talking about the period of the kings that we talked about. We talked about the, the, the ten tribes that had wandered off, off, wandered off into oblivion. We're talking about the two tribes that are now in exile. All of them basically departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants and our prophets who spoke to us. And we've listed those on the, on the charts up here, how many people were coming to say, don't you understand what you're doing here? Don't you receive what God has spoken to you? Who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes and to our fathers and all the people of the land. And nobody listened. Oh, Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to shame a face as it is in this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, 
those near and far off in their countries to which you have driven them, that because of the unfaithfulness, uh, unfaithfulness which you have committed, they've committed against you. Oh my goodness. You're talking about a prayer. I don't know what that does to me. The first time as I, I said this was revealed to me, I was on my face before the Lord weeping because I realized that that's us. That's who we are. That's who we are as Christian people who have turned aside and not done what we need to when the prophets and the word of God comes to us and speaks to about a, a, to our nation. Oh, Lord, to us belong shame of face to our king and our princes and our fathers because we have sinned against you. To the Lord, our God, belongs mercy and forgiveness. Though we have rebelled against you, you have shown mercy. We showed that in the time of judges. We drew that picture of the time of the judges. And every time they went into the pit, God would send them a deliverer. Every time they went, they followed, went off into the grass, God would say, come on back and follow me again. Though we have rebelled against, we have not obeyed the voice of our Lord to walk in his laws, which he said before us. Yes, all Israel has transcripts your law and has departed so as to not obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses has happened to us and we've been dispersed into this land because of our sinfulness. And he's confirmed his word and as it's written in the law of the Moses, skipping down to 13, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities unto understanding. And then he pleads and prays for the mercy of God to be shown in the people of Israel. And begin to see, O oh Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger, verse 16 now, your anger and your fury be turned away. Your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem, and for your people, our reproach to all those around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayers of your servant and his supplication. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is in desolation, desolate, which is desolate. Oh, my God, incline your ear and hear and open your eyes and see our desolation and the city, which is called by your name. And we do not repent and present our supplications before you. Oh, Lord, hear our, our Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, listen and act. Do not delay, delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and the people are called by your God. Oh, Lord Jesus, that's a powerful prayer. I mean, if we really would turn that kind of prayer, we'd see the same kind of thing. Just because I'm a teacher, I wanted to give you some detail in case you hadn't gotten any yet. This is a, this is a calendar of events that happened in the time of Daniel. So you're talking about this calendar, and I'm sorry if it's hard to read. It was a sheet, and it's hard to read, but yet at the same time, it goes from 722, which was the destruction of Israel. It goes up to the time where the last prophet spoke in 424 in Malachi. We see the prophetic word then went quiet for 400 years, and we'll basically talk about that. But all these things happen in the time of Daniel. Probably Ruth was in this time, pardon me, Esther was in this time also because of who she married and was, was related to the kinds of people Darius was talking about and Artaxerxes and Xerxes. These were all people that had to do with the restoration. So I've not done something with it and all you ladies, I'm sorry I did not do a page of detail on Esther when I talked to my high school 14 years old, I asked them, well, who do you know about in the Old Testament? And the number one person was Esther. They knew about Esther. And I guess it's been helped by movies and plays and people, people that like it. I did not do a chart. I thought, oh, all week long, I thought I ought to put a page in there on Esther, but I didn't. So um, we will have to just understand that somewhere in the middle of that, down about 486, Xerxes I becomes king of Persia. We're talking about that was the time frame that Esther was involved with the king's palace and the, and the protection of the Jewish people that were still in Babylon is where they were. And that was the time frame that, that Daniel was speaking to the people from 
from Susa, which was the kingdom where he was reigning from. So here we have the kinds of things. Let's just look at it. Nebuchadnezzar had been exposed to the God of gods. The Hebrew boys were chosen, the hand thrown into the fire. Nebuchadnezzar's second dream of greatness was basically handled and warned by Daniel of seven years of torment. And he was happened, fulfilled, and repented, and restored. And then Belshazzar mocks the God of gods, writing on the wall, and he interpreted by Daniel. So this is a Rembrandt picture of that. I just wanted you to see that. This is Rembrandt's understanding of that. I, I just looked at this and began to look at the detail that Rembrandt put in it. Everybody says that somewhere he shows himself so I don't know whether he showed himself as Belshazzar or somewhere, but he put himself in each of these each of these paintings that he did. And so he may have been saying, I'm Belshazzar, because he chose himself as the ones who were making fun of, of Christ at the foot of the cross, too. So Rembrandt, I just wanted you to see that, the story, the mini, mini, tickle, persis, and uh, what that meant. How many know what that means? That's one of the stories you probably know. So tell me what that meant. Meaning, meaning, tekel, tekel, persis. Come on, come on, somebody. Well, if we go back to the fifth chapter of, of let's just look at it. So starting with verse 26, it talks about the interpretation of it. Daniel 5, 26, this is the interpretation of each word, meaning God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, it, it, he's done it twice, by the way. He repeats that. Remember what we talked about? Basically, basically, basically we begin to talk about you Bible students. Anytime you see something repeated, you want to see why it's there. Because he took his time and he had, and went through at least two times with his father Nebuchadnezzar of showing himself strong, and yet the nation didn't turn aside. You have been weighed in the balance and, you bound, and you've been found wanting. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Belshazzar says, oh, that's wonderful. Thanks for doing that. You know, here's all the things I promised you. And what does it say that night? That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom at age 62. So we're talking about very real comments at the end of this particular time. So in this exile, as a result of Daniel's prayer, we begin to see deliverance start. And Cyrus was the king from the Medes and Persian that was ruling at the time. And he began to realize that God established, established Judah and Jerusalem and the Promised Land in the honor of his covenants with Abraham and Moses and David that we've talked about. He preserved their descendants in that land. Again, when I talk about the Old Testament, I'll, what I say is, you know, when I come to 5722, I said, okay, that's the end of those people. We won't hear about those people much in the scripture anymore. We won't hear about the 10 tribes of Israel. When I come to 586, in my high school class, I say, okay, close your Bible. That's the end of the Bible. The, the tribes of Judah are now gone too, so that's the end of the Bible. Nice history book, wonderful time up to the time of Judea and, and, the, and the Babylonian destruction by Nebuchadnezzar, and that's the end of the history book, so close your Bible. But it's not true, is it? Because the Lord retained for himself a covenant expression of his tribe with the tribe of Judah, preserving their descendants and their land, giving up the promise of Abraham that he would have the land, probably the promise of Moses that he would have priests and he would have the temple and would have the worship and have the law. Basically, the Medes and Persians overthrew the Babylonian 
and they were based on much more positive view of the Judean kingdom and the Jerusalem and temple. Daniel's intercessory prayer, based on Jeremiah's prophet, brought it forth. And God caused the Persian kings and Cyrus to desire to rebuild the temple. And I think we need to go read and understand that scripture that has to do with that. So let's look at that. Let's look at the very last chapter in Second Chronicles. By the way, I haven't said it maybe as much as I should. Chronicles is parallel to Kings, First and Second Kings, almost in in every manner except more detail, written from a perspective of several years later. Probably Chronicles was written by Ezra or people that work with Ezra after the exile. So at the end of the exile, they began to write that. So turn with me to the end of the book of Chronicles, Second Chronicles, and start reading at 22. Somebody want to stand up and read that really cloud, loudly for us? Second Chronicles 36, 22. Here we go. Got it. Powerful words. Now turn to the book of Ezra. Just one page. Turn to the next page. And now somebody read Ezra 1. Stand up and read that for me. Want to do that in? Okay. Read down to verse through 4, through 1 through 4. Oh, wait a minute. Didn't we just read that? Wait a minute. Isn't that what it just said? Yeah, now in the first year of our king of Persia. Oh, yeah. It just said that back in Chronicles, didn't it? Okay. Go ahead. It's pretty similar, doesn't it? Because at the very end of the, the description of the kings and the failing of the kings of both the northern, northern and the southern kingdom, we see God get put that promise at the end of it that said, it's not the end. It's not the end. So we see this. Invited a group to go back to rebuild the temple. And Zerubbabel who just happened to be one of David's descendants, basically led the exiles back to rebuild the temple. And we read it in the book of Ezra as we go by it. So let me go back to my curve that I like to describe things with. But to show you here, just a, a map. This is a map that's hard to see, and I'm sorry. I, I blew it up as big as I could on my screen, and actually I'm going to blow it bigger than that. 
But this is a picture of the Persian Empire, these dotted lines around it here. This is the extent of the Persian Inca Empire that controlled that part. So here we have in Susa, right there, that's the capital of the Persian. Uh, that was Babylon, Babylon, it was dinner. Here was Nineveh up here. You can see Nineveh right above this where you'll remember, remember jo uh, Jonah went to talk to Nineveh as the capital of Assyria, but that had now been destroyed. And here's Babylon. Down here was the Babylonian kingdom where the king of Babylon built such a beautiful place. But the capital that of, of the Persians was in Susa. So here we see Susa. And now you're going to recognize some other names on this map. Look at this. Susa and Ur. Who's Ur? What do we know about Ur? Who came from Ur? Remember Ur the Chaldees? That's where Abraham came from. He was born and God called him out of Ur 1,300 years before this. So you're talking about here we go again with the people of God going from the capital of this nation to be able to take the next step and go then to down to Ur and be able to take the – now here's Haran up here where Abraham went, and that's where his father died, and that's where his brother died. And then that he left there and came down into Judah from over here. But here we're talking about the same route. And the first group went way north. Look here. I don't know why, but there's probably some reason geographically or enemy-wise. The first group under Zerubbabel went up here. A later group under Nehemiah went along a faster route because he had the authorization of the king, I suppose, and could go pass through that ter territory safely. You're talking about a, an area of about 700 miles? You're talking a long ways. It took months to make that trip as they were going across. And so all these things that were spoken of in Ezra were necessary for the people to make the trip. You're talking about the gold and silver and the, and the livestock and goods besides the free will offerings the Lord has to build the temple in Jerusalem. So here we see the people coming back out of exile and about 50 to 70,000 of them went with Zerubbabel. So you're talking a small percentage of what had been part of 650,000 to, to a million uh, of men in Jerusalem, I mean in Ju all of Israel, but Judea itself was much less of that, and so we have about probably a third of the people deciding to go back under Zerubbabel. So this number of people, and so let's go ahead and show this now. Here we are. Oh, I wanted to blow that up so you could see that a, li a little bit better. And blow it up. Here's Susa here. Here's Ur of the Chaldees. Here's Babylon. Here's the Tigris River going up here, the Euphrates River. Somewhere in between there was where Eden was. You know, and here you have going across over to Damascus in Syria and then down into Jerusalem in Israel. So you're talking about a long ways that they went back into the land of Israel to take their part in the land of Israel. So this part of it ends up being a party that we want to look at. So here's our curve again. Let's look at this. And here we have Cyrus' commission to rebuild Israel. And we read the scripture in 1 Chronicles 36, and we read the scripture in Ezra 1, just to see that this is the connection between what the Bible says, even though it's in two different books. It's basically continuation of the history. It's just that there's 70 years between those two verses. So 70 years has gone by between the exile and 586. So now we're seeing 70 years later, we're coming back into the land under the leadership of Zerubbabel. And Ezra's writing about that. Zerubbabel went by himself with the 70,000 people. About six years later, Ezra joined him with another group of people, a second wave of people that went with the leadership of Ezra. So you're talking about these kind of 
things going on. So proclamation for volunteers. And if you want to read who went, you can read because Ezra was a, an accountant and a detailed person. And just so you want to know, every name of every family that went is listed in chapter 2 and 3. If you'd like to read through that sometime, you know, especially if you're not able to sleep sometime, that would be really a good way to prepare yourself for a night of sleeping. Although this is, uh, I just want you to know that I don't read it that way. I look up these names and I look them up and I say, oh, that's the characteristic he brought to that. And oh, Bizai, yeah, that that's, has to do with joy. And, and, and oh yeah, Jorah, yeah, that has to do with thoroughness. And oh, oh yeah, there's Hashem. Yeah, he brought details and he brought the understanding by the meaning of his name. You understand that this was a full orb body of people made up of the characteristics of of who God intended to be. And that's one of the things I joy about the scripture is that I've learned that God has put the, the fulfillment of all these different characteristics of people into the things he does. He does that in Romans. You, you, you that were here when I taught about the gifts of the spirit. One of the things you learn is I don't think a church can be complete without all seven of the motivational gifts being being really operating in the church because God wants to have a full orb personality and you and you and you are part of his body that needs to be here to complete the church. And he makes that clear by the details that he includes in this kind of passage where you're talking about every family and every father of the family that basically had, and how many of them came and what they did. And I, I, you know, yes, it's sleepy to read, but yes, I think of it in that way. And I think, oh, God, you wanted us to see how thorough you were in terms of establishing your people with the fullness of what you intended. So. Here you are, the proclamations of volunteers. And then we see that the remnant returns under Zerubbabel. And Z Dr Jerusalem is reclaimed. And they went into a structure that was pretty, pretty hostile toward them. And they went into, we see that in the, we read the book of Nehemiah, we see the kind of opposition that was in them. And we see in Ezra the resistance to building the temple. And we see the time, kinds of things going on there. The temple finally is rebuilt after several years. And then finally, we see that Nehemiah came and actually the wall was rebuilt. And again, I'm giving you an overview. We're going to go back and look at some of the detail in this right now. So here we are, sent by Artaxerxes into the land. So you're beginning to lead the people in a powerful time of covenant renewal. Oh, God, you've spoken again. Oh, God, you've led us through the wilderness. Oh, God, you've led us again into the land. Oh, God, you've thoroughly, basically let us rebuild that which has been taken away from us. Nehemiah faced many obstacles, and at the end of his life, he was able to say, Go your way, eat and drink sweet wine, and send portions to those who have nothing prepared, because holy is our God. One who mourns because the joy of the Lord is your strength and allowed them to rebuild that city. And so it was that the covenant was restored. Well, let's look at Nehemiah for a minute. Nehemiah came in about 50 years after Zerubbabel. Ezra was still there and still part of it. So he and Ezra, originally these two books, just for you Bible scholars, Originally, these two books were probably the same book. Ezra and Nehemiah were probably not divided the way they are in our Bible. They're very similarly written, although there are some changes in them, but yet it allows you to see from two perspectives what was going on. Because Ezra and his details and Ezra of his understanding of the law and basically the input to that was teaching the people about how to live as godly people. And Nehemiah came along and supported that but had his own issues that was going on that we'll talk about. So here we have to talk about in the book of Nehemiah. And I want to just, I want to, I love Nehemiah. You know, uh, there's, I keep saying that I love these guys and this one, this book, and, and I do, all of them. 
this is my favorite book. Well, this is my favorite book. No, this is my favorite book. I don't know. This is my favorite person. But I have three people that I see as different than other people in the Old Testament. One of them is Joseph, and you already know how much I like Joseph and the story of the economy and the Egyptian culture and the cycles of economics that I learned about it and how much I got from his preparedness and his use of giftings and all the management skills that he used to be able to do what he did in Egypt. I love Daniel because as a consultant, see, I, I was a consultant much of my career and uh, worked with executives in long-range planning, the strategic planning. I worked in information systems, installing systems across hospitals. I told somebody recently, I was talking about, I said, we've trained 12,000 people in Mayo when we put our system in, in uh, when we put it in the Mayo Institute in, in, uh, in Minnesota. And you're talking about, you know, 24 by 7, we had people on the ground working with them to install uh, the systems in every nook and cranny, and everybody that had to touch their system had to touch anybody who touched our system had to be trained. And so we, we had detail. Well, I love Nehemiah, or I love Daniel as a consultant because he lived through three regimes. That's, that's amazing. You know, if you work for a company, let's say you're a wonderful advisor to one company and you work for ABD, ABC company, and along comes XYZ and buys ABC, ABC, what's the first thing they do? What I say is they shoot anybody that knows anything, you know? And uh, I've worked, walked through the merger. I was a vice president in Seattle, and the company bought ours, and all six of the vice presidents were gone within a year. And uh, because they basically wanted their people in those same roles and to do what they thought was right for their company. And we, did, we were the old school that knew how to do it the old way. And uh, so, anyway, so he made it through three regimes. Worked for Nebuchadnezzar, interpreted for Belshazzar, and now he worked for Cyrus and Darius and all the Medes and Persians that came after that. So you're talking about an amazing person, and I look at him, I say, oh, God, what was the characteristics? I can learn how I can match that and go into those places and work for different people with different ideas and draw from the same conclusions and yet keep my principles as clear as Daniel kept his principles. What an amazing man. The third person like that is Nehemiah. He's a consultant too. He's a special consultant to the king. He was the, he was the uh, person who was probably most intimate with the king outside of the man's wife in terms of what he knew about the details of everything he ate and drink and preferred and knew and did and everything because he basically, every time the king drank something, he said, oh, let me taste that first. Oh, yeah, it's okay. You can drink it. You get to know somebody pretty well when you're eating and drinking at that level, you know, and yet that was his job to protect the king from any destructiveness that might be around him. So Nehemiah... He does something here, and I've loved it. I call it the remember prayers. And he, he has nine of them that I've listed here that basically says these are prayers in the middle of his activities. He shot them up like an arrow into heaven. And they're not very long. I mean, he doesn't take a long time. He, well, he actually did. He was in sackcloth and ashes, but he finally got to the point where he, the king called him in. He says, hey, Nehemiah, I've noticed you've been a little distraught lately. What's going on? Wow. You're subject to death when you're that way in the king's presence. So what did he do? He shot one of his remember prayers, and he says, remember what God had pro remember, oh God, what you'd promised Moses. Return, God, that they could return and that you would rescue them. And he shot that up as an arrow as he went to talk to the king. I prayed in my heart before I spoke to the king. The next time was the enemies were plotting against him to work on the wall. And we'll see that right away he got there and had opposition almost immediately to what he was doing. And he went around. And the wisdom as he did that, if you're a management person, read Nehemiah very carefully. You'll be a wiser manager after reading that book. 
if you look how he handled situation, how he handled conflict, how he handled worker motivation, how he worked, how he worked, worked with the resources, how what, what he knew was essential, what he could do, what other people could do, how to delegate, how to form organizations to be able to do it, how to do it efficiently, how to celebrate when they had victories, and how to weep when they had defeats. Just a very real person in terms of management style and leadership and the things that go along in, in the book of Nehemiah. His enemies were plotting against him. And serious enemies, Tobias and Sanballat, they were all from the people who dwelt in the land before the Israelites came back for the Judea, into Judah, and they were pretty opposed to them getting along. And they worked pretty good for a little while and got along, but as soon as they exercised any kind of leadership and strength, their enemy rose up against them. He basically, now I want to turn to Nehemiah 5. This is one of my favorite. This is one of the ones we'll talk about. Well, maybe I'll talk about it in a minute. Yeah, yeah, I have something else I'm going to say about that. But in Nehemiah 5 was the same way. He was talking about how the people were not doing what the Israel culture and the law of God told them how to deal with the poor and the needy. So hold, that, hold your Bible there, and we'll talk some more about that in a minute. To, here we have Tobias and Sanballat, and others are trying to discredit Nehemiah. And he asked the Lord to remember what the men had done to stop the project. Lord, you've given me this project to do. You put it in my heart. You put it in your heart to do this. And I'm here doing it. And these people are effectively against me. The people begin to tithe again. And the first prayer was, starts out, remember me, O Lord, how I restored unto them the blessing and the outpouring of God that comes by a generous giver. I mean, he knew that was going to begin to impact the, the culture and impact the people that were struggling. Nehemiah saw to the purifying of the people that they had gone back into the old ways, the things that had gotten kicked out of the land to begin with. And here they were doing it. The next one, confronting the people who had married the foreigners. How could you do that? Don't you realize that's what the whole line of Solomon, kings afterward, that was the thing he introduced that brought destruction to the land of Israel and the ten tribes are gone and the two tribes are just barely back from, from exile and you're already marrying the foreigners? How can you do that? You're bringing their culture back in to the lives of your children and the lives of your families. So you're beginning to do that. So Nehemiah, he trained and assigned priests and Levites to do all the priestly duties again because they didn't know how to do it. And he and Ezra began to read the law and began to show and began to lead them in the ways. And one more time, he says, remember me at the very last verse in the book of Nehemiah. He says, remember me, O God, for good. Remember me for good. So these remember prayers, I love these remember prayers. I mean, in the middle of that conflict that you're having at your office, fire a prayer up. Remember, oh God, you called me to do this work. Remember, oh God, I'm here to represent you. Remember, oh God, you have provided good things in the past. You can do it again. Remember, oh God, how, how you spoke to me in the past. Yeah. Remember, learn these remember prayers. I love them. So let's look at what happened. So here we are. These remember prayers. And here we are, if I do a, again a little section of my curve that I like to use. This is the restoration part of the curve. And here we are down here, the recovery and the restoration. We're beginning to build the land. And Ezra is back and, and um, Zerubbabel is building the, building the, pre, the temple. Progress stopped. Nobody doing anything. So turn with me to the book of Haggai. And those of you who don't know it, you uh, want to look at your index and see that it's my wife will stand up and tell you where it is because she has all these memorized. I always turn to her, now where's Haggai again? And she goes through her list of prophets that she has memorized and does it. But just in case you want some help, it's between Zephaniah and Zechariah. That helps because those are bigger books. 
so you might find those easier. Right between those. Haggai. Look at this. I love this chapter. I don't know. I've got to be careful. I don't run out of time. I've got too much stuff to talk about. All right. Haggai. And this puts it in time frame. Notice where it is. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet. And this is the, this verse, key verse, is one of the rare ones in the Bible that you'll want to know about. Came to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. So in that room, you have all three parts of the kind of ministry God calls for. Prophet, priest, and king. We're in that first verse. So you know this is an important message when he calls all those three parts together. This isn't just Joe Blow the plumber and, and Tom the, the scribe. This is prophet, priest, and king in one place. And he says, thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, the people say time has not come that the Lord's house should be re re rebuilt. And then the Lord, word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, it's time for you yourselves to dwell in your nicely paneled houses. And this temple still to be in ruins. Consider your ways. And here's what we're doing. Look at this. You have sown much, but you reap little. You eat, but you don't have enough to eat. You drink, but you're never satisfied. You clothe yourself, but nobody's warm enough. And he who earns wages, look at this. He earns wages to put, a, put it into a bag with holes in it. The Lord says again, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and build the temple of the Lord that I might make t take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much. Here it is. You looked for much, but indeed came to little. And when you brought it home, look at this. I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts. Because of my house that is in ruin with every one of you runs to your own house. Therefore, the heavens above you basically is, is withholding the dew and the earth withholds its fruit. I called for a drought in the land and the mountains and on the grain and the new wine and the oil and on whatever ground brings forth, on men and livestock and all the labor of your hands. Because of, look at this. Wrong priorities. Wrong priorities. The worship of the Lord is first. The Lord in the, in, the, in the Sermon on the Mount said it pretty simply, right? What did he say? Seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things shall be added unto you. So the restoration stopped. You know, we were happily building the temple over here. I went back to that other picture. They were back building the temple, but it stopped because the people were so busy building their houses and trying to grow crops and feed their families and get ahead and take over from the enemies. But they had forgot about the worship of God. That's why Zerubbabel sent them. Cyrus said, why are you, am I send you back to Jerusalem? To build houses and make nice places for you to live? I sent you back to build the temple. And Haggai the prophet comes to them and declares that. And in this time, this is the time frame. This is Darius. This is the Medes and Persians. They were in rule over this period. This is the time of Daniel. This is a time when the Lord is speaking in Jerusalem to the people under Zerubbabel and Ezra. So it goes on pretty good. Here we are. So we get a little further. But again, the progress stopped. 
And this time, turn to Nehemiah 5. If you turned to it before, you had your finger there already. I should have hoped, told you to hold your finger there. Nehemiah 5, look at this. I think this is a, this one, I think I saw these headlines on the newspaper yesterday. And, you know, I brought up Yahoo News headlines, and I think it's, it was quoted right out of the book of Nehemiah. It said, it said, um, there was an outcry, 5-1, and their people and their wives against the Jewish brethren. Huh. Oh, that sounds familiar. For those were those who said, we are sons and our daughters are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we might eat and live. And there's the ones who said, the prices are too high. And our lands and our vineyards, our houses are too high. And there's high taxes to we buy grain for the famine. And there's others that say, we borrowed money for the king's tax on our land and vineyards. And now our flesh is the flesh of our brother and our children and higher interest on the, on the loans. And indeed, we're forcing our children and our sons to be slaves. So there's not enough food. The land is mortgaged. The homes are mortgaged. And the children are enslaved to the future. And some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem them. For other men have our lands and our vineyards. They've taken it over and they control it. And Nehemiah, being the docile, mellow manager that he was, it says... And I became very angry when I heard these outcries of these words. And after serious thoughts, <laughs> and one of those remember me prayers, I rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said to them, each of you is exacting usury from his brethren against the law of Moses. You don't charge the family interest when you, borrow, when you loan with money. We have redeemed our, Jew, our, our Jewish brethren who were sold to the nations. Now, indeed, are you now selling them again? Or should they be sold to us? That they were silenced and found nothing to say. He says, what you're doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of the Lord because of the reproach and not become like nations around you? And I also, with my brothers and my servants, are lending their money and grain, but let's stop usury. Usury is not just normal tax, normal interest. Usury is exorbitant, the kind you have on your credit card, for instance. 18, 21, 24, I don't know, big numbers like that. That's usury. God doesn't like it. Restore now to them, even this day. And the question is, why did this happen? Why did the work stop? Why did the progress come? Why did the famine come? Why did with God withhold the food and the, and the produce of the skies? Because again, stopped by the greed of the people who saw an opportunity to take advantage of other people that were struggling. Restore now to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive groves, and their houses, and a hundredth of the money and the grain and the new wine and the oil that you've charged them. Give that back to them so they can again get going on their own lives. So the people, I love this. I wish I would have worn my, my, my other coat. I should have put it on so for this part of it. I love this part. He says, restore now to them even this day in their lands. So they said, we will restore it and require nothing from will. We do as you say. And then I called the, recruit, 
the priests, and I required an oath for them that they would do according to this promise. And then I shook out the folds of my garment. And this is where I click in the robe. I can see him in his robe just shaking that out. And he says, he said, even so, may God shake out every man from his house and from his property who does not perform this promise, even that he may be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, amen. And all the praise the Lord, then the people did according to the promises. So we went on and began to restore them and began to build the wall and finish the wall in what? In 52 days. 52 days because of the organization and the skill and the, and the outpouring of the Lord. They completed the wall and began to live in much more security in the city of Jerusalem. Well, this is my story for tonight. The divided kingdom. We've seen some prophets and by the way, when you come back on the 15th, I'll be back from my Mexico trip on the 8th. So on the 15th will be the last lesson of this series. And this is what we're going to talk about, is this chart. But we're going to talk about it in the sense of what did they say about the new covenant? What did they say about Christ's kingdom? What did they say about the kingdom of God under the Lord of Lords? What did they say about the New Testament? And one of my favorite verses is in Luke 27 on the road to Emmaus when they were going back and were discussing about what had happened after the death and resurrection, proposed or thought, rumored resurrection of Jesus at that point. And it says, and Jesus starting with the law and the prophets told them about himself. So in one lesson, 90 short minutes, on the 15th, we will finish up this section by talking about what did these people say about who Jesus was and who the Messiah was and why is Jesus fulfill all the law and the prophets. So, after only nice, easy, the effect of God's leadership in the kingdom, cultural impact, idol worship, the effect of leadership, the kingdom was divided and destroyed, the northern tribe went away, never to be seen again, the southern kingdom continued with the seed of David and looking for the promised Messiah. How do you apply it? Well, there it is. God sought the attention of his wayward people through every way possible and to try to pull them into the knowledge of who he was and, and to call them into himself. Prophets and disciplines and finally exile. Is God trying to get your attention? What's he saying to you? But remember, he is a God of mercy and our fellowship will be restored with him. So here we are, completed nine easy lessons. <laughs> nine, those of you that have been with me through the beginning, nine easy lessons. By the way, I have notes from all of those lessons. If you didn't get any, you can get some. Nine easy lessons. Uh, there was three lessons in lesson nine, nine, nine A, B, and C, nine, nine, Northern Kingdom, nine Southern Kingdom, and nine Exile. So actually there was more. So we'll talk next week about the prophets. Next week, not next week, week after on the 15th, the prophets speaking to the new, tech, new covenant and talk about the new covenant in Christ to end our, dis our study of the Old Testament, God and covenant history. So. Hope you've enjoyed this. Hope this has been helpful to you. You learned something tonight that you didn't know. That you go home and pray Daniel 9. <laughs> oh, Lord, Jesus.
go home and pray for our nation. Oh, God, we pray the prayer of Habakkuk, the dead of our nation. We heard more about it today, and now it's beginning to be the point where it's going to start some, some things happening that are not good. And we begin to hear about the dead, dead in our nation. Habakkuk 2 tells us about that, what we talked about last time. Oh, God. Let's stand together and let's rejoice. Lord, I thank you for covenant faithfulness. Your message written to the children of people of Israel, you admit your your purpose and your ways written to the whole world. And Lord, we just take this moment just to again commit these words to you and let that which brings conviction and redemption, repentance and redemption to us to be in our hearts. And Lord, as we've talked about a lot of details and a lot of issues of the majority of the written word of Bible, we've talked about that in, in these short lessons that we've brought over the last several weeks. Lord, we could spend all day on any one of these talking about what was meant and how it was said and who else and key people that we would know about. And Lord, we just thank you for the privilege of this work as we brought it together these mo in these moments, that the, it would take root and grow in our heart. Lord, most of all, if there's un one single thing that I would pray, oh Lord, I would pray that you would put a new hunger for the word of the Lord in each of these people. That they would read it with new hunger and say, oh, show me about this and let me see that. And what does that mean? And how does that fit? And what did you mean by that, O oh Lord? And let the Holy Spirit minister the words off the page and the words out of the scripture and reveal to them the spirit of the Lord as he unfolded in Jesus' name. Lord, you made it all possible by your death and resurrection. That is the message of the covenant. That is the message of the gospel. You shed your blood that we might walk into the presence in the fully and boldly and to know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yes, thank you. Only one? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I believe some of them were there hoping to improve the situation, bring peace to it. Probably others were there for business purposes. Uh, some of them, they, don't. they may they so. I don't know. Some of them knew pretty long, yeah, long. Yeah, Some of them were missionaries. Yeah, I mean, like that is, well, yeah. it isn't when they're in peace. When they're in peace, it's a pretty nice nation. Thanks. Nice being with you. It is. It's hard to watch. So well, there it is. Next week. Okay.